Hi, this is Rebecca from Built by Back. Today we're going to be talking about building this amazing storage cabinet. It's actually based off of a $3,000 design that I found online, but of course I knew I could build it myself and I know you can too. So I'm going to show you the step-by-step -step of how to build it yourself. And there's free plans in the description below if you want to check that out. And let's get started. I started by cutting all the red oak to size. I got this red oak from my local lumber yard. I usually have them rip straight two edges for glue up, so I don't have to do that at home. I really don't like joining large boards, so this makes it so much easier. So I glue everything up and then I use calls, which are those two pieces of wood to help it stay flat. And then I cut everything to size with my track saw. I really pushed myself with this build. I am just gluing up the entire cabinet with wood joinery. It's really easy. I used a top bear bearing mortar sing bit to make dados. So basically what you do is put a large board where you want your shelf, make sure it's nice and square. Then you're gonna slide your shelf in the middle and then slide another piece right up against it and clamp both of those side pieces down. This is gonna give you the exact width that you need for your shelf to be in so you can cut your dado with your router. I accidentally cut one a little too high, my bad, but I'm just gonna fill it in by cutting a small piece of wood and then gluing it in. Hopefully you won't be able to see it later. Dados are grooves that are made in the center of a panel, whereas a rabbit is made on the end. So I'm making rabbits on the top and the bottom of each side panel. This way, the top and the bottom of the shelves can fit right into them. And then I don't have to worry about squaring everything up when I go to glue it up. I just glue it, clamp it, and then I'm done. Then I cut all the shelves to size with my track saw instead of my table saw because it was just a lot easier dealing with these large panels and then I glued everything up. I really, really love to use blue tape on my joints and this prevents glue squeeze out. It's a lot less mess than I have to clean up later on. And if you don't know already, glue does not stain well. So if you get glue on any joint or anything that you can't get off and you try to stain it, it is not going to stain properly. Then I just glued it up and slid all the shelves into their dados and it was a perfect fit. I clamped up the first three shelves instead of trying to do the five of them at once. So I did the center three and I left that to dry for about 24 hours. And then I glued the top and the bottom shelves and I left those to sit for 24 hours. Since this is a stressed joint, I decided to leave it clamped that long. If it's an unstressed joint, you don't necessarily have to leave it for that long. I just like to err on the side of caution. Now it's time for the doors. Since these doors are so tall, I just took the four pieces I needed and put them all on my miter saw together to make sure they were cut at the exact same length. For the rails, which are the shorter pieces, I use my miter gauge on my table saw. I like to sneak up on the cut when I'm using a miter gauge because then I get a really accurate measurement. Since these are shaker doors, there's rails and there's styles. So the shorter pieces are the rails and the longer pieces are the styles. Thank you. 
There are several ways that you can join these doors. I decided to do mortars and tenon joinery. Like I said, I'm going a little bit, doing a little more woodworking joints for this entire build, but you can definitely use dowels or pocket holes for this as well. But if you wanna do mortise and tenon, you're going to set the fence down to about a quarter inch and then set your blade to half inch. And this is my test piece. I really always like to do a test piece before I run my final cuts. Especially with oak, I don't wanna mess anything up. So you run it through and you're gonna flip it over and then run it again on the other side. And that's gonna make sure that you have the exact spacing that you need for that mortise. Then I ran through all the other pieces. For the tenon, which is on the rails, I set the blade to quarter inch height and then I set the fence to half inch. And this will make sure that I have a half inch long tenon so it can fit right into that half inch deep mortise. And I cut those to size with my miter gauge. And don't worry about it butting up against the fence for this because it's such a shallow cut you're not really risking any kickback and you're using your miter gauge for this. If it was a full cut through, then I would be worried, but for this one, you should be okay. Just go slow and be careful. I glued both doors by just putting glue on the tenons and sliding them right into the mortise. I made sure it was square after gluing up every single piece. And this is so, so important. I also glued it up on the cabinet because I wanted to make sure that I had everything fitting correctly and exactly where it needed to be. Because since this is an overlay door, it is flush with the outside of the cabinet. So if I didn't have it flush, then I would have a lot of sanding to do. And I wanted to make everything as perfect as it could be to start off with. So I didn't have to do as many adjustments later. After that was glued up, I used a rabbiting bit. It's a 3 8 inch rabbiting bit to wrap at the back side of the doors this is where the glass will sit into. It's really important when you're routing the inside of any piece that you're going clockwise. Whereas if you're routing the outside of a piece, you're going to go counterclockwise. And this will prevent the router from kicking back at you because it's the way the direction of the bit spins. I set my depth for the bit to three eighths of an inch as well. This will give me plenty of room for the glass to sit in and then add those glass clips to hold in the glass. I did have to square off the corners because of the router leaves those rounded edges and I really didn't want to cut the rounded edges on my glass, so the chisel it is. I used overlay hinges for this build. These were actually easier than inset hinges. I used my Craig hinge jig to bore out the holes and then I just attached the hinges. It's super easy. I recommend this jig to anyone. I've used it on every single project that involves doors. Then all I had to do was butt the door right up against the cabinet. I pre-drilled, I love this Montana brand centering drill bit. And then I just screwed the hinges right onto the cabinet. 
Now it's time for the legs. I doubled up the legs for this. So these are two inch thick legs. I had to laminate the legs together to get that two inch thickness because I didn't want to pay for more uh, wood and I didn't want to pay for two inch thick wood because it's really expensive. This is a great way to do it. You can't really tell when it's actually stained. I did decide to add the taper like it was in the picture. I tapered from about two inches to about one and a half inches to make it so it wasn't as thick because two inches is pretty thick for a leg. I used my miter saw to cut the tapers. I made a miter saw jig, which is so easy to make and it makes repeatable tapers every single time for these shorter pieces since I couldn't clamp them to the fence. I use double-sided tape. Make sure it's really stuck on there. I use X-Fasten woodworking tape. It's that double-sided tape again and it sticks so well that I had to literally take a chisel and pry it off of there, which is what you want, especially with a blade turning in your face. You don't want anything to kick back at you. So I tapered these two sides here so that I wouldn't look too wide. And now I'm going to make the legs. I know not everyone has a domino. That is okay. For this base, if you want to go easy, you can also use pocket holes because they won't be visible or you can use dowels. Either way, it's going to be plenty sturdy because you have those two inch legs which the cabinet is sitting on. So any type of joinery method that's your favorite, go ahead and do it on this. For the bottom of the drawer, I doubled up two three quarter inch thick pieces of plywood to equal one and a half inch thick so that the drawers could pass the hinges. And then I just screwed them into the side. So I'm gonna have one on this side, one on this side, and then one in the center here. And then I'm gonna tape the bottom. Now these drawer slides, these drawer slides, this just needs to go right up against this lip right here because the front is going to be the same exact width of this drawer. Southern and I feel like I just want to talk in a Southern accent right now. It's not good, but you know. Well, I cut these to the sides of the sides of the drawer slides, just a teeny, teeny bit longer, maybe like a half inch longer. Um, I'm going to use the spacers again to attach the slides. is a laser, a digital measuring tape. Pop it up against here, and then this will measure the exact distance for me. I'm just gonna pop this up a little bit. 14 and 15 16s. So, now that I have my pieces cut, and I just pop, I just put them on here, nothing is attached. I'm gonna measure for the bottom panel because I'm gonna make that those dados along the bottom so that the panels can just slide right in. For the drawer dados, I usually set my blade to quarter inch in height and my fence to half inch. And this gives the plywood that's on the bottom a nice groove to sit into so it's nice and durable.
Whenever you glue up a drawer or anything that's a box shape, right angle clamps are your best friend. I'm so happy I went with these slow close drawer slides. I had these in my shop and I wasn't sure if they were slow close, but I'm so happy they are because I think it really elevates a piece, especially because I have little kids and I don't want them slamming their fingers in drawers. I used these eight inch spacers on the bottom of my drawer to make sure it was even on all four sides. And then I use the double-sided woodworking tape to attach the drawer face to the drawer front. Again, this double-sided tape is so sticky. So the minute you stick it on there, it is going to stay. So this is amazing for drawer faces. It makes it so much easier to actually screw in the drawer from the back of the drawer. I like using spack screws for this part because you don't have to pre-drill. It's really hard to pre-drill inside of a drawer because especially one that is as shallow as these, it's hard to get my drill into there. So all you need to do is screw it in and you've got your drawer. So I probably should have routed out the back before or I put the whole cabinet together. So you can do it this way. It involves a little bit more work. And I rounded over the fronts of the cabinet doors. This makes it a little bit of a softer look. And I also did this to the base. To safely attach the base to the cabinet, I'm using figure eight fasteners. I love figure eights and I know I say this in every single one of my videos, but they are so easy to install. All you need is a drill and a Forstner bit, about the same size as your figure eights. And then you're just gonna drill your hole a little bit deeper than the thickness of the figure eights. Make sure you're chiseling out the sides though, because this will allow for the figure eights to move back and forth with the wood movement and that's going to prevent any cracking or warping it's so easy to install anybody can do it Since I made this entire build out of red oak because I wanted to stay under $500, I wanted to get rid of that red tone before I stained it. So I used Boardwalk, which is a paint color from Real Milk Paint, and I watered it down like crazy. Like it was barely, probably any paint left. It was mostly water. And I did two coats of a paint wash. So you're just gonna spread it on really, really thin and then wipe it in the direction of the grain. And this gave me a really, really pretty tan color. Now you can stop here if you want. This is about the same color as the cabinet in the picture. So if you want more of the white oak look, this is a great way to do it. You can just put some clear wood wax on there and be done with it. But I decided I wanted something a little warmer this time. 
my entire house is mostly white oak. So I decided to use the chestnut brown wax, which gave it this really, really pretty, I'm calling it aged oak color because it gives it that more antique, warm look, which is exactly what I was going for. Plus, if you're using wax for furniture, it is the easiest finish to apply and I am not exaggerating. All you do is take a cloth, dab it into the wax, rub it into the grain, and you'll wait about 10 minutes or so, and then use a clean rag and wipe it in the direction of the grain. If you don't want to use a rag and you want to go a little bit faster, I would recommend using a brush that's specifically made for applying wax. I think next time I'll do that because it will probably be a little bit faster than using the rag, but I absolutely love the color that it turned out. It really accents that oak grain. I used a quarter inch back for this piece and just attached it with my nail gun in the groove. And then I added the glass. This is actually not real glass. I bought a sheet of plexiglass from Home Depot for about $65. So this, all this glass was $65. I priced out actual glass and it was gonna be more like 300. So I said, there's no way I'm doing that. And I just cut it to size with my oscillating saw. So it made it a lot easier to actually cut it than just cutting glass and then I installed it with these glass clips which are super inexpensive. I know I also say this in every video, but jigs are also your best friends when it comes to woodworking. And I love this jig that helps me install my knobs. It makes it accurate every single time. And I use these little antique brass knobs. I think it's perfect. Of course, Riley had to help finishing up. She just loves to work on projects with me and I love having her. And here is the finished cabinet. I love how it turned out. I'm using it also as a coffee bar. So it gives us so much more counter space in the kitchen. What do you think? Let me know in the comments and don't forget to check out the free plans in the description.